Please open your Bibles to 1 John 2, verse 28. 1 John 2, verse 28, where we're going to begin in just a second. Place your bookmark there. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 28. Don't forget, Brother Larry McClinney will be here April 29th and 30th, as was announced. Looking forward to that. Make sure it's on your calendar. Man, it's going to be here before we know it. It's the end of this month, actually. So April 29th and 30th, Brother McClinney. So good to have Tracy back with us from from her time out of town. I'll let that sink in a minute. It's good to have Russ back, too. Miss him, well, I can't say that, but I, I enjoy it when he's home, he preaches, and I enjoy listening to him preach. It has been a very good day, hasn't it? We've gotten to sing, we've gotten to pray, we've gotten to study God's Word, and that's what we're going to do again tonight. First John 2, verse 28, please. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is." And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. There are numerous titles in Scripture that denote the people of God. We sometimes see the phrase, the elect, the chosen ones of God, the holy ones, the saints. We see the Christians, disciples of Christ. Lots of really good descriptions, and each one is is significant. Each one is a particular element of our identity, our discipleship following God. So each one highlights one of those important things about who we are supposed to be. But I would argue, perhaps, few of them are as thought-provoking as this one. The one John uses so much in this epistle. Children of God. I want us to really think about that phrase tonight, children of God, because John's going to actually give us a lot of emphasis on it here and in the next section. He's going to really bring, up, bring this to our minds. We are God's children. Now, as we're thinking about that in, in the realm of the world and in the realm of our own homes, I think that the, the emphasis of that phrase should impress us even more. Because the way we have our own fathers, our earthly fathers, and the way that our relationship works with our earthly fathers, there are few folks, there are few who sacrifice like fathers do. Now, I'm not talking about mothers. Just hang with me a minute. But you understand what I'm saying. The way a parent loves their child, the things they do for their children, the way they sacrifice for their children, the way they love their children. And yet John picks that same description, children of God, and he lays it across the Christian. That means you are a child of God. There's a few things I want us to observe from this text tonight. It won't take us terribly long or hopefully be awfully boring to get through it. I hope it will be encouraging because it has, it has encouraged me. This is some things that help me get through the day, and I hope they'll help you as well. God is my 
Father. So a few things that means. Number one, children of God are born of him. Let, let's look again at verse 28 and 29. Verse 28, 29. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Born of him. John kind of likes phrases like this. In fact, you may remember the phrase born again comes from John's writing. John chapter 3 and his discussion with Nicodemus. And, John, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of the Messiah. And so John pulls in some of that same terminology through this epistle. These people are born of God. That's how they abide in him, by the way. But see, when you're born of someone, and in verse 28, you're abiding in someone... That, that means you're living a certain way. That means you're conducting yourself a certain way. In fact, when you're born of someone in this context, he says, if you're abiding in him, when he appears, we may have, get it now, confidence. Not only may we have confidence, but we may not be ashamed before him at his coming. Two, two sides of that same discussion, and both of them are equally important, equally significant that we can have confidence in who we are and what we are and whose we are. And with that, there's no shame. You know, there, there is such a thing as being ashamed of yourself in view of your father. Not living up to the standards. Not living up to the kind of man he was. But is that not true in the same realm when it comes to Father God? We talked about this before at different points, but, but this is exactly, in some respects, what motivates us to serve God. It's not, because I, it's not simply because I'm afraid of going to hell, folks. But it's because I've seen what my Father has done for me, and the last thing I would ever want to do is disappoint Him. That's, that's motivation, folks. That's motivation because we're born of Him. We want to stay living in Him. Now, the phrase used in, this several, in several verses here. He's going to mention this appearing again in chapter 3, which we read a moment ago. All of this reminds us, no matter what direction we're looking, the Christian finds motivation for doing right. You, you see, the Christian can look back and he sees the cross of Jesus Christ. That's motivation to live right. The, the Christian can look into the present and what he sees, what they see is, is themselves and their need to live a righteous life before God, but they're also seeing brethren that need their encouragement and help. A Christian can look in the future and can see him appearing and finds motivation to be right before him. No matter what direction you look, there's a reason we're born of him. And there's a reason we are to abide in him. We either see a great reunion coming. There's a great day coming. Well, I couldn't miss that reference, sorry. There's a great day coming. But also, there is the reality of a terrible day coming, as we sing in that song. And so the way we abide in Him now determines that. Reality of judgment or the promise of reunion. Uh, number two. These children of God, they marvel at his love. Notice this in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. It is a fascinating thing. You know, in Romans you can kind of see this, and we're going to turn and look at a passage that does this in a second, but you'll see glimpses of the apostle writing, and he'll say something, and then he turns right around and he goes, wow, did you get what I just said? And he kind of does that here. We're born of God. We are abiding in God. We can have confidence because of God. And then he turns right around and he goes, Behold what manner of love the Father's bestowed on us. We should be called children of God. It's almost as if he is blown away by this. How often do you really stop and think about the love of God? Russ even referred to John 3.16 this morning. Well, the great slogan verse of the Bible for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoa. 
What manner of love that is. And there is a sense in which God is the Father of all creation because He is the Creator. But that's not the kind of love we're talking about here. We're talking about a very special sort of love. I want us to to kind of look at a few things here. That last statement in verse 1, Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. I think there's a, a very real and present truth to consider that we don't worry so much about what the world's doing because of who our Father is. And there is some respects in which the world and, and us will always be against each other, again, because of who our Father is. I want us to look at a few passages very quickly. Romans 5, please. Romans, the fifth chapter. Plug in a few different passages here to kind of help flesh this, this point out. Passages with which we are very familiar. Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Folks, I, I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, but, but I, must, I must say there are some brilliant statements in that. That God, through His Son, helps those who are without strength, those who are ungodly. Verse 7, those who were not even good in some respects, or maybe every respect. Individuals who were lost in sin and couldn't help themselves, and yet God helped them. And you think, well, that's, that's kind of intense by itself, but then He heightens the drama in verse... Sinner condemned to hell. That alone is humbling. And yet in that predicament, God looked on me with with no hate in his eyes, with no desire to see me condemned to hell, no desire for me to remain lost forever. And instead what he does is he offers up, wow, he offers up his son? That's the love of God. That's the love the Father had toward us. Go over to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Spend a little time here Wednesday night and a little bit of time here this morning. But but again, I just want us to kind of put this together with marveling at the love of God. This is exactly what's in John's mind as he's thinking, what is this, the love of God? Verse 31, he begins the discussion here as he's wrapping up several of these concepts. Verse 35 is really where, where he really hits the nail. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, that, that, that not only is a statement of confidence by Paul that none of these things affect the way God loves us, it's also a statement, it's also a statement that should reinvigorate us. You know, this is in part why I can confidently face tomorrow. I, I'm going to tell you, I have never, I have never faced the sort of thing Paul's describing here, but Paul had. (laughs) I I have never been so destitute that I could describe myself as naked. I have never been so destitute that 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 I would lump in words like tribulation, distress, or persecution. I have never been so destitute to say the word famine. Have I had to eat sorry, nasty ramen noodles before? Yeah, last week I did. 
It's going because I didn't want to cook. But folks, I have never been afflicted like Paul was, and yet here's Paul's confidence. None of that affects the love of God. None of that affects the way that God loves me as his child. This is exactly why, and you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 6, Galen referred to this in his prayer. This is exactly why we can have confidence, folks. In Matthew 6, verse 9, he says, Pray in this manner, our Father. He's he's our, we share Him. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. How can I have any confidence that God cares about my daily bread? Because He's my Father. Because He loves me. Towards the end of this, in verse 14, He says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses trespasses. That's exactly why you can go to him in prayer. That's exactly why you can be confident that he cares about you because he's your father. This is the manner of love at which John marvels. Back in 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. When Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, you cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you, do you appreciate, folks, that we know he cares for you because he's father? That, that gives me confidence. That gives me some level of assurance. I've I've made this illustration before, and if I've made it here, forgive me. My father and I are not very close. I love him. I have tremendous respect for my dad, but, but he's not a Christian, and so fundamentally, we just we don't have a lot to talk about. I don't punch cows anymore. I don't cowboy. Maybe say that in a more relatable term. Punch cows, you're thinking I actually hit cows. That's, no, that's not what happened. But, but I don't do those things anymore, and that's all dad knows and wants to talk about is cows or hunting. But I'll tell you something about my father. I could call him any hour of the day or night, And if I needed to talk to him, he'd take the call. Now, if that is the way it works with our earthly parents, how much greater is it with our Father in heaven? This is why John marvels at the love of God. This is a blessing we have as children of God. Number three. Number three. uh, Number three, children of God... Live in view of the future. Back in 1 John 3, 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for He shall, or for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. There's kind of an interesting thing here. We're children of God presently, but we're also looking forward to the future reunion where we'll get to actually see Him face to face. Behold His glory as He is. We are children, folks, who are longing for His appearing. Longing for the day He comes back. And that's exactly what He says in verse 28, that when He appears, that's what He's talking about. And then in verse 2 of chapter 3, when He is revealed, that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're looking towards. When we get to go home. And and, and that truth is what motivates us to live every day better than we did yesterday. That truth is what re-emboldens us to be faithful even when hardship occurs. To try to find encouragement when we're really discouraged. It's because we know at one point, somewhere in the future, we're getting to go home. You think about maybe, maybe when you were younger and your parents started leaving you at home a little bit. Mom would say, I'm going to be home at 5 o'clock. What were you doing all day long? You're keeping an eye on that clock. Probably because you're doing something you're supposed to be doing. That's not describing everybody. I can appreciate that. But you knew that's what time mom's going to be home. That's what time my parent is going to be home. So you look forward to it. 
And even in the positive realm, you look forward to it because there's somebody who's going to nurture you, somebody who loves you, somebody who's going to hug you, somebody who's going to feed you. Folks, in a very real sense, we're looking forward to the future where we get to receive our inheritance. That's where inheritance comes from. Because we're going to get what God has been holding for us, what God has preserved in heaven for us that does not fade away, that is there. I'm ready for that. That's what God has promised to His children, to long for His coming again. It's a subtle thing in that text he essentially says he's going to appear. We know that because he appeared. <laughs> kind of like Russ made the point this morning. Folks, we, we have confidence in the future events of what God has promised because of the past events. We look at what Jesus said, and then he proved it. And, we, and he said some other things, and he proved those things. And, and now what's going to happen? The future things that are still yet to happen. He said he was going to come back from the dead. What happened? Jesus came back from the dead. He says he's coming again. Guess what's going to happen? He is coming again. And when he gets here, he's going to take us home to the courtroom of God. One individual made the comment, he says these, the unrighteous conduct is unthinkable in the Christian who has grasped the purpose of the two appearings of Christ. The fact of his first appearing and the hope of his second are both strong incentives for holiness. <laughs> I kind of liked that. The fact that he appeared at all is humbling in itself. But then the promise that he's going to come again is incentive to be exactly what he has called us to be, holy as he is holy. This, my friends, is why the New Testament writers on numerous occasions would make statements like Maranatha, Lord, come. This is why they would say, as John does at the end of Revelation, even so, come Lord Jesus, because they know what's waiting, just as we know what's waiting. I, I, I think I've got a challenge that I need to work on, but I imagine most people need to work on. How often do you pray that God comes? Typically what we're doing is thinking about all those who do not have what we have. And so we kind of say, Lord, come. But then in parentheses we say, but wait, wait just a little longer. God's children are confidently praying the same prayer. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of His saving grace. That's what I want to do. And God's children are praying all the time that it, that it comes, that it comes. Hope that he describes in verse 3 is what feeds out of this. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Folks, hope is not so much about what God is doing today but about what he will do tomorrow. And that is exactly what drives his children forward. We live in view of the future. And then number four, and finally. It's kind of an interesting thing. As John is writing some of these concepts, it's as if he just can't help but think about Jesus. In verse four and following... He says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. You see what he does? Like committing lawlessness, that's a no-go. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one who never committed any lawlessness. <laughs> Jesus. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. John is, is very concerned about sin. And you see it actually, the word used a ton just in these few verses. Very dense, but lots of statements about sin. The gospel is always against sin in every capacity. Jesus came to take care of sin, and so God's children are against sin. 
And God's children are trying to live without it, to put it out of their life. Jesus is our motivation for holiness, and he's also our example for righteousness. And, and you see that kind of come out here. You look at Jesus, you look at Jesus, you look at Jesus. It's exactly what he did. Lived a sinless life, gave himself as an offering, pure. And he serves as our example today. I, I want to stress one thing, and I'm going to take just a minute from you, but I want to stress one thing because I think it is this important. In verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Look at verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. I want to make a clarification. This is not talking about an individual who is struggling but trying to live right. This is not talking about habitual sin, where somebody just kind of keeps the little pet sin in their closet and doesn't really show it to anybody and just kind of keeps it to themselves. That's not what he's talking about. This individual, this individual is, is not that person. And so I think we need to do away with some of those, those tendencies. God is not after perfection. But he does want you to try, and he wants you to try hard, and he wants you to sometimes, as Robert Turner used to say, perfectly try. I liked that. But you're not... You're not you're not sitting here thinking, well, you're going to just never make another mistake again in the rest of your life. And the minute you do, you're lost for all eternity. That's not the point of the gospel. And yet sometimes I think that's the way we feel. The goal is to be sinless. There's no question about that. But we're not trying to be perfect. We're trying to sin less. I had a lot more I was going to say on some of that. You think about how that relates to God being our Father. I am not perfect. In fact, I think sometimes I am a big holy as He is holy who wants me to live right, who encourages me in the book to live right, who shows me how to live right and will accept me as long as I am faithful to him. Why does he do all of that? Because I'm his child. And so why can I get up tomorrow and try to, try to live better than I did today, knowing I'm going to make mistakes? Why? Because I'm his child. Why can I face darkness and frustration and discouragement? And have hope because I'm his child. We've not sang this since I've been here. But I want to share this one line with you. Must my prayers be loudly spoken just to know the Father hears me? Must I die with no one knowing just to know the Father sees me? Praise the Lord, I am forgiven. And my Father up in heaven knows and hears and will be with me. Praise the Lord, I am His child. Children of God. Does that describe you? Are you a child of God? Have you been born of Him? We've kind of hinted all around it tonight, but I don't know if I've made the point just outright. You do that by being baptized for the remission of your sins. That's the born from above of John 3, the born again, the born of him in this passage. You do that by being baptized for remission of your sins, and then you can call yourself a child of God. You can have the confidence and hope that he hears you, that he cares for you, that he wants to take you home one day, and he absolutely will through his son. Can we help you tonight be a child of God? Perhaps you're a child of God who struggled with the world and has went away. Now's your chance to make it right. The Father wants you home. Will you accept tonight? If you will, come forward now as we stand and sing.